magnificent bridge <laughs> but it's, it's quite easy to design a bridge if the span's quite short and the the load it's carrying is 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 almost negligible but it's a lot harder if the bridge is longer longer and the load it's carrying is a lot larger and that was a challenge faced by the engineers in the early 19th century who were building the railways across Britain So this is a great western tank engine uh, from about the 1930s, the sort of thing you'd see on a, on a branch line train. Uh, and even though it's a small locomotive, you can see how, how massive it is, how, how heavy it is. But it's not just its weight that, that damages bridges. Uh, and to understand that, I'll just explain a little bit about uh, how it works. So, so these are the cylinders. Uh, inside the cylinder, there's a piston. It's very much like a car engine, but when steam's admitted to the, to the cylinder, it pushes the piston back, and that forces this connecting rod here back. But can you see, the crank pin here, which is attached to the wheel, the crank pin's in line with the centre of the wheel. No matter how much steam you admit to the cylinder, it's not going to be able to move the uh, engine at all. So this is the left-hand side of the engine, OK, here we are on the right-hand side of the engine. Now, you'd expect that the wheels would be 180 degrees out of phase. The crank pin would be up here, but it's not. The wheels are actually 90 degrees out of phase. The crank pin's at the bottom, and that means when it's in this position, when steam flows into the cylinder, it can push against the wheel and rotate the wheel, and that means that the engine can always start from a stationary position, whatever attitude the wheels are in. Let's try that with a camera somewhere else. I've moved my cranks around so they're 90 degrees to each other, which is just like the steam engine. <laughs> I can't find the pedal. I can't find the pedal. <laughs> there, that's got it. I cycle every day and it's just really very odd, this. It feels like sort of cycling on a kangaroo. But it's very uneven and I can, I imagine you can see that. Feels it. And this sort of uneven loading causes real damage to bridges. <laughs> so here's my model bridge. J just ignore this bit, it's just a guide rail. This is the bridge itself. It's a steel bar, and when I force down on it, it deflects downwards, uh, and the bottom of the bar goes into tension. So I've got a strain gauge that's fixed to the bottom of the bar, and that measures the tension. So that measures how much load I'm applying to the bridge. So here's, here's my steam engine. It doesn't look much like a steam engine, but it's just a trolley that I can uh, move across the bridge. So, so I'll do that now. Uh, 
And here's the trace from the strain gauge. It starts from zero here, builds to a maximum when the, when the train's in the middle of the bridge, and then drops back down to zero. And we know that steam engines don't run smoothly like that. Because of the cranks, they apply a cyclic load to the uh, bridge. So we can see here how we've replicated that. We've got this disc with an outer balance mass on it, and we can spin the disc around as we're driving across the bridge. So let's see the effect of that now. So we've got the new trace here with all the spikes on it and the old trace, the smooth one behind. And you can see two things. The maximum load on the bridge is higher, but also you've got lots and lots more load cycles applied to the bridge. In the 19th century, railway engineers called this cyclic loading hammer blow. The material that they could use, cast iron, was, was a hopeless material. For one thing, it's very brittle, but also in the size of casting you'd need to make a, a railway bridge, it would be just covered in, in defects. So we've got a small specimen of cast iron, and we've put our, a deliberate defect in it, this is to replicate the size of defect that you get in a large casting. And we're going to use this test machine to apply cyclic load to the specimen using this hydraulic cylinder here. So here we put a specimen in the machine. We're supporting it at both ends, just like a railway bridge would be supported on pillars. And we're using the test machine to apply cyclic loading to the specimen in the centre. And failures like this happened in practice. A famous example is in 1847, when a bridge carrying a passenger train over the River Dee failed. A bridge designed by Robert Stevenson, causing significant loss of life. And it isn't just history. Today we have to design structures that are subject to cyclic loading, whether they're bridges or aircraft. And it's only through advances in material technologies that we are able to design these structures with more confidence. Thank you.